I used to sunbathe under warplanes, stripped down on the roof next to dust, oil, and generators. It would smell like the color ochre and tar. And I used to lay down dust in my hair and sun, scalding, and warplanes would trundle overhead, gridlocked, jettisoned by national interests. And I used to watch them, apprehensive of the voyeuristic eyes of soldiers. I could see their drone-like faces sometimes, sunglass-clad and ironic. They would make pretty outlines in the sky, and I would trace their patterns, one eye forming shapes and stories, the other observing their fly-like sturdiness. The way they rent the stale air like sirens in a snowstorm or how the sun did not reflect off their blackened bodies. And I used to make stories, dozing and sun-drunk. I would imagine warplanes competing for my attention like admirers. No matter where I lay, they always made a point of flying over the sun, eclipsing the orb that confirmed this was a hell on earth. Childlike and petulant, my warplanes used to zigzag in front of it, demanding an attention and forcing a reaction. I tired of them eventually, like a worn out lover. They buzzed like flies around my head in the morning time as toothless old men ate tea dunked bread and the nation's litter festered in street crevices. They journeyed incandescent through the sky with no one to tell them no and no birds for company. I found myself wishing for soldiers to court me and whisk me into their planes, show me my city charted from on high, Aladdin-like, show me the world, shining, shimmering and splendid. I'd imagine the more rational side of me knew that Aladdin's city looked better sketched. The mythical fables of galleons and trinkets were buried under decades of strife and humiliation, perched under the oil so desperate for exploitation. It's funny, now, looking back on the stagnant events of those summers, hours spent wiping sweat with the backs of hands, how I became an optimist. Fresh bread in the shape of diamonds and flirting for visas behind the cool black of custom. It was a nation of unlovables, scarred and scared by centuries of misuse and abuse, passion, red and oozing like blood out of their seams, slithering down their faces, confused for tears and mingling with the blacks of their feet as they walked under telephone wires. It had a poetic beauty, cursed as it was for tragedy. I dare say a cleverer man than me could coin phrases imbued with mourning and sorrow. I seem to have missed it somehow, reinterpreted the calls to prayer as British birdsong and saw the soldiers as confused young men with something resembling potential. It gave me a joie de vie that was missing in this cycle of consumerism. Maybe it was the idea that it can only get better, or perhaps it put my failures into some sort of perspective I liked that cucumber was only available in the summertime. And I still enjoyed the thrill of power cuts. It was a glass half full approach that juxtaposed nicely with the despondence so prevalent around me. I know war cannot be good, but even under bombs and barrages, the sun still caressed my stomach burning ice. And I watched the spectacles of warplane fly by overhead. Thank you. That was called Sunbathing Under Warplanes, and I wrote it in about 10 minutes last summer when I was revising for my um, second year exams in the library over here, um, about the summer I spent in Iraq immediately after my A-levels um, when I was 18 in 2011, um, when the war was ostensibly over. And for those of you, I mean, you must have gathered by now, Iraq is such a hot country, like, we're not talking like, 30 degrees, Met Office has issued a warning hot, I'm talking like 52 degrees by day. So I would do all my writing in the middle of the night when it was about 30 degrees. Um, and I think maybe because of that, I remember it vis vividly. And for me, that's what's so powerful about the writing process. Like well, now when I look back over my journals, I feel like I'm there again. And it kind of, writing picks you up and transports you to another world. And I find the people that influence me, Influence is a difficult world. The people that get me thinking the most are the people who sort of articulate those wordless synapses that go on in your head. You know, those things that you think and you can't really put form to, <clears throat> sorry, and can't put your finger on. And they sort of look at the same things that I look at, but from a different side and make me see it from a different perspective. And that, they're figures like 
um, Sylvia Plath and Mahmoud Darwish and Eminem and my amazing, oh, you shouldn't laugh at the Eminem. He is a lyrical genius. Um, and my old <coughs> school friends from home who are amazing. And I think the reason why I turned to these people trying to find answers more than my contemporaries when I was growing up was because growing up, I really, really, really struggled with the notion of identity and a homeland. I'm half Palestinian, and Palestine doesn't exist under UN law, so that one's out. Half Iraqi, um, and well, we know the story about that one. And, but born and raised in London, so I, but, and now I live in Paris, so it's a pretty controversial mix. I think like I'm a co North Korean boyfriend away from being the most controversial person on the planet. Um, <clears throat> and I think, <laughs> that one just came to me, it wasn't scripted. Um, and I think that having such a controversial heritage, for me, I really found quite difficult to come to terms with because all my friends were pretty comfortable with who they were and I spent the whole time thinking, Am I Arabic? Am I British? I mean, it's such a mixture of languages and cultures and religions and identities um, and just sort of sen even sense of humours. And I found myself really sort of trapped in this space between all these worlds. But about 18 months ago, when I started writing and performing poetry, I realised that having such a controversial, for want of a better term, heritage, has made, you know, really made me work that much harder for answer, answers. And my conclusion, which frustratingly seems really obvious now, is that identity isn't a standalone title. You're never just black or just a woman or just middle class or whatever. You're sort of a mixture of these things and you can have more than one and they can get along just fine. You just have to make your peace with it. So bearing all of that in mind, um, I'm going to finish with a poem that kind of touches upon this. We don't know it yet but our streets are being lined with mutants. That's right, Cyclops, Iceman, Angel and Storm are reborn, unworn, and not yet torn, and they walk between you and me. They sit beside you on the bus and the tube. They man CCTV, fight adversity, guard gas stations, sell us commodities. They help us when our dishwashers break and save us when lives are at stake. We never thank them, barely acknowledge them, and some of us even try and fight them. And you know, some of us don't even know they exist. Yet they persist, assist, and insist on anonymity, secrecy, and public decency. They don't inform us that they have different DNA. Chromosomes creating new characteristics, flaunting evolutions, logistics, statistics mutating in the face of the future race. Imbued with gifts and talents unknown, powers not yet shown, they've grown into hybrids. They will have stomachs made of diamonds, caught in the liminal, still experimental, only first, second, or third generation, still nestling into a new location, not yet credited with integration, struggling to lay some sort of foundation. I'm not talking X-Men, I'm talking immigration. You see, our immigrants are superhuman. They uprooted, traded their lives, and stepped into the shoes of ghosts, all for security, for safety, and the myth of no more poverty. They sold their soul to Beelzebub for a British passport. Now they're cutting teeth with locks on keys in faraway lands like spores. They were strewn across the world, the diaspora. And they are mutants because they are an amalgam of here and there, enacting a marriage of mannerisms. They keep cellophane on TV remotes and won't take the plastic off new phones. They bear the pain of leaving brothers behind, events that time cannot rewind. They watch tacky soap operas and collect cool cards like stamps. Some of them build empires, some build pyramids, some dwell in wastelands, and some lose their grip on it. They struggle to say where they're from on their Facebook profiles. And they circle other on the NHS race forms. They introduce Diwali, Hanukkah, and Eid to Christmas. They sat Yom Kippur and Ramadan next to Lent, and they gave thanks to God knows who. They work twice as hard to be considered half as good, and they are the brave ones. Where we only speak one language, they speak two, three, four, mother, father, brother, tongue, where we only know the sun to set in the summer, they felt the monsoons rough and the sun's strength. Where we only know skin as white as moonshine, they know men with eyes the color of rainbows. And lands where women with hips and thighs are still considered beauties. And where we only have one identity, they have a plethora, each laid onto the sediment of the last. And they're not called Wolverine, Shadowcat, or Dazzler, but Patel, Muhammad, and Muller. But in this version, there's no Professor Xavier to unite them, to nurture and support them. He's not there to prove that these, super, these mutants can be superheroes. Westchester Mansion is hidden in Bromley, Bradford, and Brixton. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've arrived at our trouble. Magneto's brotherhood of mutants appear out the rubble. They now control our newspapers, our radio, and our publishers. They lurk in parliament committee rooms and sit in city boardrooms. They have barbecues with our neighbors and sort out our taxes. They think evil thoughts, speak poniards in every word, stabs. They insult our intelligence with their falsities and upset our children with their dualities. And I hate myself for saying it, but I reckon not even Mr. Cameron can save us now. We've got into this rut and we don't know how, so fight. Though the mutant genes are not your own, throw them a bone, let them call this Marvel Universe home, and for heaven's sake, just leave them alone. Because we are born, we live, we die, the years they keep on flying by, and the thought of hating seems so silly when the remedy is educating. We created passports, borders, and ethnicity. We invented race and dichotomy, so sit on the tube with your head held high. Realize that the guy by your side, like you, looks to the sky. Realize that though what he says may be unknown, by discriminating, you're alienating one more superhero from the throne. Thank you. Thank you.